Se va a proceder a la defensa de la tesis doctoral de doña Flora Souza Bacelar. Eh, se informa a la candidata de que para optar al, al título de elección europea tiene que hacer parte, la parte que le juzgue eh, oportuna de la presentación en, en un idioma distinto al castellano. Y aunque no hay ningún límite de tiempo, se recomienda que no pase de una hora. Y cuando quiera. No, perdón. Muchas gracias. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you all here, so thank you for coming. And I'd like first to give the thanks to my parents that could join us. <laughs> I'd like to thank to my fiancé that he could not be here, but is watching through the video. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all members to accept coming and for reading my thesis. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to give a special thank you to my supervisor, Emilio Hernandez Garcia, that I was a great guide in this work. So the title is Nonlinear Dynamics and Regime Shifts in Ecosystem. It is a cross-disciplinary work that was realized in this institute, and as I said before, supervised by Emilio. And the idea of joining different areas of knowledge is a growing aspect in science. Since there are several questions in many areas like chemistry, global changes, economics, and in my case in biology, that new a change of perspective, gives uh, points of view in order to seek for solutions. In this um, direction, many mathematical methodologies were developed in the context of physical sciences to the understanding of biological processes. Not only understand these processes, but con construct a common language in order to understand and make predictions for the, the several problems in biology. Uh, firstly, this area of knowledge was called biological in 1925, uh, physical biology, but uh, both names, mathematical biology or physical biology, is found in, in this area. It depends on how a spectrum or which researcher is working in order to make models to describe the phenomenon. As a physicist, I can use the concepts I studied in my graduation and in my during this PhD, like statistical mechanics, complex systems, and nonlinear physics. The starting point of this work um, was inside of, of in the threshold environmental sustainability project that was an integrated project that, which aim was to study ecological disturbances, discontinuities, and so, uh, thresholds effects as the consequence of human perturbations. <clears throat> For that, uh, I could work with several different problems in ecology. The first two was related to marine ecology, and the third was studied patterns in savannas and the roles of fires and competition. And the last one was related to natural selections and evolution of male bias parodity. And the first work uh, I studied marine ecology, that is basically the study of marine organisms and their relationships with other organisms with the surrounding environment. Basically, in marine ecology, we studied the interactions between abiotic factors like chemical and physical and geological elements, such as light, temperature, salinity, tides, currents, and biotic factors that is related to the interactions among the living organisms. These interactions among the living organisms basically is described by food chains that describe the feed interactions among the species with an ecosystem. And what is import import important here in, the, in these interactions is the roles of bottom-up that is represented by the food input, competition for food and other resources, and uh, the effect of top-down that is related to predation and grazing. In the first work, um, I studied, I related these species in the feeding um, functional response, and studied the effects during enrichment, that is the input, the increase of input of nutrients, and how this process of enrichment is changed by the contaminants. <clears throat> For that, uh, we consider uh, the anthropogenic pressures like growing good nutrients and contaminants, 
uh, like human agriculture and industrial activities, like exploitation of coastal areas, agriculture, fiction, and tourism, that changes the number and the intensity of nutrients and contaminants in the environment. And uh, it is very important to understand the interactions between pollutants and nutrients because it's difficult to evaluate because these interactions have the direct and indirect effects. And many facts only can be attained uh, when we make models because we, obviously we can't uh, pollute our ecosystem in order to see how these ecosystems will evolve and how we can do uh, the, the process of opposite uh, process. So for that, in the first work, um, focus on a particular model that is the Canary Cane Staff model that is very similar to the Rosa Macato model, except for the first equations that describe the nutrient input and the flush of these nutrients out of in the in the system. Basically, these equations descri describe the nitrogen in several compartments of the system. The first one is related to the top predator, that it, in this case in the, the marine ecosystem is the fishes. The second one is the predator, that is the zooplankton. The third one is the phytoplankton, it represents the prey species in this model, and the nutrients. Since we are uh, in, in the the predation function is represented by the aholin type 2, predation functional response. And the main parameters we study here, since we are studying the enrichment process and the, the, the effects of contaminants, are the nutrient input and the mortalities. So in this case, the contaminants will affect how the mortalities changes in different levels uh, of the, the food chain. So we use a typical functional response that is a shape that when we study the process of toxicity uh, in different groups uh, biological populations, we have this side model function. So in this way, we have uh, mortalities as a function of the contaminants. In this system, we have uh, the main attractors of the systems are uh, the first one is in which all the species are zero. And then we have uh, the second one, fixed point, important fixed point in which we have the presence of nutrients and phytoplankton. The third one, we have the coexistence between phytoplankton and zooplankton. And we have the coexistence of all species in which we have the phytoplankton, zooplankton, and the top predators that are the fishes. And also we have cyclic behaviors. We have one that is uh, oscillate around the coexistence of all species and one the last one that is lying on the hyperplane in which the top predator is zero. Now I will explain how in the process of enrichment, when we increase here in the abscess uh, the nutrient input, how the biomasses of each species, each group uh, in this uh, ecosystem changes. At very low values of nutrient input, what we have is that all species are zero. And then you have the presence of only the nutrient concentration. Then at very low values we have the first transcritical, transcritical bifurcation in which this solution switches the stability with the presence of phytoplankton. Then this uh, fixed point remains stable until a second transcritical bifurcation in which the zooplankton appears uh, as a non-zero biomass. And then, uh, until the third one, for speech bifurcation, in which we have the coexistence of all the species. An interesting result here is, despite increasing the nutrient input, what we have is the nutrient concentration decreases uh, by mass. This is due to the effects of top-down control imposed by the top predator in the other levels of the trophic trof trof chain. In order to increase the population of top predators, is we increase the nutrient input, but this remains until a certain point in which the system is start oscillating around these these uh, these solutions, and then we have a hot bifurcation too. That is you now the paradox of enrichment, in which the control of uh, um, population cannot increase indefinitely. So until a certain point, you can increase this population biomass. 
but the system is start uh, oscillating uh, after that. So firstly, we apply a contaminant toxicity to the phytoplankton, to the, the, the prey species. We see here that we have the same um, sequence of bifurcation that we have in the absence of contaminants. So here we have the variation of uh, contaminants, and here we have the concentration of nutrient inputs. So we increase the nutrient inputs in the, in the ordinate, and in the abscissa we have increase in the contaminants um, concentration. We see here the same, the same um, uh, order of transcritical uh, of the bifurcation. We have a transcritical bifurcation one, we have a transcritical bifurcation two, a hope bifurcation that happened just before. So this uh, plays no role in this case because uh, the system, uh, the solution is stable. And then we have a hope bifurcation two. Increasing the, the contaminant concentration, we, have the, we see the effect of cycle model function that for intermediate values of contaminant concentration, we see the effects of the contaminant. Uh, we, we found here a co-dimension two point in which some um, bifurcation switches stability. So we can see here that the hope bifurcation one and transcritical bifurcation three changes a uh, switches stability. So in this case, the system start oscillation before the top predators become stay as a, a non-zero biomass. So the contaminants say that uh, anticipates the oscillating behavior in the system. So seen here in another perspective, if you fix the value of contaminants, we see the, uh, the bifurcations until a uh, bifurcation one in which the system is remains oscillating the hyperplane in which the top predator is zero. So we fix the value of nutrient input, we see that firstly at low values of the contaminant input, the top predators appear as, uh, as a non-zero population, then we have the coexistence of all species, and this solution decreases biomass until happen a hope bifurcation three and the system is start oscillation. The cycles decreases value until touch the hyperplane in which top predator is zero, and then when we increase the, the contaminant concentration, and then uh, we have a extinction, completely extinction of top predators. So this is an interesting and indirect result because this, despite in applying contaminants in the bottom of food chain, we see that the top predators are more affected than the other species in the, the, the food chain. So, analyzing when we apply the contaminants to the zooplankton, the predator species, we have the same sequence of bifurcation, except that the odd bifurcation are displaced to high values uh, of contaminants. An interesting result here is that we, despite applying the contaminants to the zooplankton, we see that this population remains as uh, the same via biomass. So, it seems that the contaminants doesn't affect these species. But after the top predators goes to zero biomass, we see that these populations decrease until uh, its complete extinction. So concluding, uh, we have that at small and moderation contaminant concentrations, the main effect is a displacement of the different bifurcations to add high values of nutrient loads. Contaminants increase the stability of food chain with respect, respect to oscillations, caused by increased nutrient input. So uh, the, the, the oscillations are displaced to higher values of con uh, concentration, nutrient input, and caught, and uh, we found the caught zone, but we're not focused in this work, but these regions is for higher values of nutrient input. For higher contaminant values, in most of the cases, there is a reordering of different transitions. So we have that the system start oscillating, before the top predators appear as a non-zero population. Uh, in the case of absence of contaminants, this doesn't happen. And the top predator seems to be the species more affected by the pollutants, even when contaminant is toxic, only one lower trophic levels. In the second word, uh, work, <laughs> sorry, uh, we studied the competition between primary producers and only uh, in the effects of enrichment process as well and the competition for resources. So we have two primary producers. We have the floating plants, 
that are on the surface, so because of that they are optimal competitor for light, and you have submerged pants. The submerged pants are optimal competitor for uptake nutrients, since the submerged have roots, it can uptake nutrients from the sea, the, the sediments, and from the water column. So, I will not explain all the equations, but the equations are in the text and very they explained in the, in the text. But I will explain the, uh, the sub-models and the idea and how we use these models. The model was constructed using a validated and existing models uh, published. And the first one described the dynamics of ULVA, that is the so, uh, floating plants. And in this, we describe how ULVA uptake nutrients from the water column, since they are the floating plants, and how this dynamics is forced by temperature and uh, the changes of solar radiation over the year, and the same as for Zostera marina. The difference between these two is that this one has roots and can uptake nutrients from the sediments. An interesting detail in this model is that we aggregate in this system the dynamics of nutrients. And this basically we describe the process of nitrification, that is a biological oxidation of ammonia with oxygen into nitrite and the nitrite into, into nitrate. So we describe this process of nitrification in the water column and in the sediments. And how this competition between these two changes one changes the flows of these nutrients in this case. I will not focus here on the facts of phytoplankton, but I will tell in a, at the end how the phytoplankton changes the competition between these two primary producers. Since the phytoplankton is a uh, uh, competitor with ULVA for uptaking nutrients from the water column. So, all, during all the simulations, what we have are forcing functions that is related to temperature, how temperature changes over the year, and how uh, light intensity or solar radiations changes over the year. And the first result we have is fixing the water flow and consider a very low values of nutrient inputs, we see that zostera, that is the submerged plants, wins competitions against ULVA, that is the, um, the flow to mine. This is because the water, uh, we have a low concentration in the water column, and then the submerged plants can uptake at the same way zostera marina can uptake nutrients input. So zostera wins because <coughs> can uptake uh, nutrients from the sediment as well. So this describes the case in which the sea grasses expand in your coastal zones. Oh, sorry. Uh, in the second case, we've increased the number, the concentration of nutrient value. We see that uh, the opposite happens. The sustainer goes to extinctions and ulva uh, in wins the competitions. This is because uh, we have high values uh, concentrations of nutrients in the ecosystem and the, this causes an uh, effect that is very low, is algae bloom, in which the submerged plant grows faster than, than the, uh, the floating goes, and then causes a shading effect on the, the submerged plant, and this, this one cannot uh, capture solar radiation because of the shading effects of the, the floating plants. We see here, uh, we did a study, that since we consider the nutrient dynamics explicitly in the model, we can uh, study how the flow of <coughs> nutrients in the ecosystem change and how these change the uh, effects of competition between these two species. We see here that at very low values of flow nutrients, zostera wins the competition, so this is the region in which zostera wins, and the upper side uh, happens uh, in case of the ulva, that is the floating plants. We have here an asymmetry in regarding to ammonia and nitrite because zostera rhizomes can uptake nitrites and uh, the, the other parts of this plant can uptake from the water column in uh, nitrite. <coughs> so, this, this, in this picture uh, we can see that the 
the characters and the changes in behavior and the competition of these two species are more important in the flow rather than the initial values since I showed before in the first pictures. We fix the flow and just consider our nutrient inputs. And here you can see how um, changing the, the flow of nutrients, the dynamics changes. So it seems that it's more important than the initial uh, concentrations only and the times the flow <coughs> water flow. Here this result is very interesting because you could describe the effects of global changes, of global warming. We consider here in this picture the same values of the first one, uh, the first result I've shown, in which the uh, zoster marina wins the competition. But in this case, if you increase temperature in one degree, we see that zoster marina lo uh, loses competition and the ulva, the floating plants, with the competition. This, is, this means that for global uh, warming, we see that opportunistic algae wins competition is more favored than the seagrasses. Uh, in the case of uh, solar radiation, this in, for biologists is not well understood, but uh, uh, we can interpret these results as how the depth at which zoster is able to grow could be modified when competing with fever. So we see here that for a high intensity of solar radiation, zoster marina wins competitions against ulva. So despite ulva is optimal competitor for light since they are on the, the surface, if you increase the solar radiation of is the depth in which the seagrasses are not too depth, they can these species can win the competition. So concluding this work, we have studied a competition model that analyzes the susception of primary producers, communities in coastal shallow ecosystems, and we have agreement with experimental observations, since uh, I didn't tell before, but uh, some parameters were used in Mediterranean stations, uh, like the forces of temperature and then solar radiation. And we have the result that at high nutrient level, urban attempts to win the competition, and at low nutrient level, zoster attempts to win the competition. However, if you increase the temperature in the ecosystem, we see that this uh, primary producer switch the stability. So, despite you have low nutrients uh, input, we see that ulva wins the competition in this case. Uh, we, in addition, we also uh, study environmental conditions like temperature, uh, as I said before, and in intensity, so how the depth changes the competition between these two species. And in the case of the phytoplankton I didn't uh, show here, basically this enlarges the regions in which zoster marina wins the competition. Why? Because phytoplankton it, uh, competes for nutrients uh, in the water column together with ulva. So both phytoplankton and ulva, that is the floating uh, plants, competes for nutrients. This decreases the growing of population of submerged plants. It is decreases the shading effects on the seagrasses. So in this way, we can enlarge the region of parameters in which the zoster marina wins the competition. Now I will present a. a a different work that is related to spatial patterns in savanna. We study how, uh, trying to understand how exists the coexistence between trees and grasses in this spatial environment. So, what is special about savanna environment that allows trees and grasses to coexist? Despite, despite biologists studying study this, this ecosystem, we do not understand well why we have this uh, coexistence between trees and grasses. So many uh, models were proposed. Someone uh, in our historical focus on tree grass competition for water. Someone just um, uh, the demographic models that just control the biomass of tree trees because. Savannah especially is a grassland with scattered trees. So we have few trees in, compar in comparison with grasses in this ecosystem. And there are another models that emphasize on disturbances like fire, herbivory, rainfall. But just a few models consider the role 
of competition between trees. And some of them that consider this is too complicated in order to understand separately what is the role of fire and competition in this case. So, in order to understand these two characteristics or two elements, the students' elements, we propose two questions within our model. What are the individual and combined effects of competition and fire on tree density? And how do competition and fire interact to promote different kinds of spatial trees? To that, we propose a combined model that was a model, uh, we combined a model, this model, using the first previous model that was realized for our collaborators here, uh, Federico Vasque Cristobal that are here, and Maxi San Miguel and Justin Calabresi in Volk Green, that basically they describe a, a lattice in which can be two states, grasses and other tree. And the fire in this model is a statistical uh, element. So the fire can appear or not randomly in the lattice. So the idea here is to introduce fire as a state of the system and see how fire goes, how is the, the front fire in the lattice and how it changes the patterns in savannas. So for that, we use uh, the idea of forest fire models that uh, present critica criticality and some spirals and uh, they have, but we change. In other, in forest, what we have, the burning state are the trees, but in the case of savannas are only the small shrubs and grasses. So we adapted this model in order to have the combined one. So we have five states. We have grasses, juvenile tree that can be burned. We have adult tree that in this case cannot be burned because they are resistant to fires in savanna. Our trees in savannas are species that evolve in the case that are more resistant to fire, and the burning state, that could be grasses or juvenile trees. And we have ashes, and the rules are the following. We consider here the depth, an adult tree can that become a grass state at alpha rate. Growth, a juvenile tree grows to adult one at A rate. And we have ashes, when we found a burning state, the next time step they become ashes. And the birth is the following. One other tree can spread seeds for the near and far neighborhood. And this seed, when, reach, when this seed reaches a grass state, it can be established or not, depending on the competition. If how many uh, trees is surrounded, uh, we have more competition, and then uh, in this way uh, can decrease the probability of this become a juvenile tree or not. And the fire appeared in the lattice with a probability F and the fire is spread by contact process and we have some states that can uh, have immunity. So since you have here in the picture, not all parts of the grassland are burned when touch the fire. So, studying uh, first how these two important parameters related to fire and competition uh, change the biomass <coughs> of trees. So, first, we study the lightning parameter that is related to so how it increases the, fire, the frequency of fire um, and uh, the savannas. We see, found here that we have a phase transition between grass and savanna state when we have the coexistence between tree and grasses and the grassland. We see that the recovery rate, uh, if we increase the recovery rate, these uh, transitions, it goes to lower value, values of lightning parameter. So as much fuel we have to fire, the, we have more probability that this, the fire expands uh, and then drives to trees to extinction. In the case of competition, in the first, in the previous model, the, uh, that we they consider the two states, the competition only decreases the biomass of trees. But here, since we have the presence of the fire explicitly, if increase the value of uh, fire intensity, this can drive trees to extinction as well. So we see that uh, the competition parameter reduces more biomass, 
and the fire is more important in the transition between uh, savannas to grassland. So we see here that increased the uh, competition coefficient for higher values of frequency of fire uh, drives trees to extinction. In order to understand uh, when we have uh, the explicit effect of fire, we try to see the positive and negative effects of surround trees to a juvenile one. In the first model, uh, when we, uh, we consider a juvenile tree ju uh, surrounded by adult tree, they have only one uh, negative effect, that was the competition for resources. In this case, since we have the fire as an explicit state in the system, the surrounded tree can protect the juvenile one against fire. So in this case, we have positive and negative effects of the neighborhood uh, in this case. So the competition we knew because of the probability is the same in, as in the previous model. So what you see was simulate this, uh, this process Allowed, allowing uh, one fire uh, to happen in the lattice and then increase the number of neighbors and to see if it can survive or not. So this is the number of neighbors and this is the probability of survival. So we see here that increase the number of neighbors, we see here that uh, the, we have the total protection. So if we have the more neighborhoods here, all the eight neighbors protecting, uh, the fire cannot burn this uh, juvenile tree. Combining the two effects, the positive and the negative, we see that despite increasing the number of neighbors in which we increase the competition uh, effect, that is the negative one, we see that the protection is higher than the negative one. But for a certain thresholds of competition parameter, we see that increasing the number of neighbors, the negative effects are more effective uh, rather than the, the positive one. Now, we studied uh, how the patterns are modified uh, in savannas. For that, we use a part correlation function that we can study how pairs are organized in savannas. And uh, he, we can study the pairs for the for the first neighborhood, the second neighborhood, the third, and so on. And here we can find that change of the lightning um, parameter, we can find all the spatial formations uh, in savannah. We have a regular spatial formation, and we have a transition one that can be considered random for uh, in the first neighborhoods, and then we have a clumped one in which the trees are grouped and, and <coughs> small clusters. In this case, in the first model, we, we only just find open kinds of agglomerations of trees. So here we represent the open agglomerations and the, the closed agglomeration. The open one is represented by the pair correlation function that in the, we have more neighbors in the second neighborhood rather than in the first neighborhood. So here we, we see that the clusters are not compact. In the second case, we have that more neighbors in the first neighborhoods rather than in the second neighborhood. These kind of clusters are not found in the first one because the fire can appear suddenly in, in, uh, in, in each place of the lattice. So the, the fire can appear in the middle of the cluster, so uh, transforming this closed cluster into this one. So this kind of clusters cannot appear, is not what's not found in the, the first study. This uh, kind of formation switches when we change uh, competition and lightning. So we have a transition to one to the other when the change will increase uh, competition parameter or if you increase the, the frequency of fire. So we see interesting here that if you increase the frequency of fire, it's more probably we have more prob probability to found closed clusters rather than to open them. Uh, another interesting result here is that changing the values of lightning parameter for a uh, very closer to a percolation transition, we have a power law uh, behavior in the system. So this uh, explains more or less the results that uh, was published in Nature uh, some years ago, in which they kept 
uh, photos from satellites and they studied how trees uh, are distributed uh, in the system. And they can find that for some savannas in Africa, they can, can find a uh, power of distribution. So, uh, concluding this third work, we have a tree tree competition can be a major constraint on tree density, thus facilitating the robust coexistence between grasses and trees. And fire has several indirect and direct effects on tree grass and tree tree competition, introduce both positive and negative effects. Not fire introduces, but since fire is explicitly stated in the system, we can study the positive and negative effects. Because if you don't have this state uh, explicitly, we cannot study the positive one that is related to protection. And we can find all uh, patterns like regular, the clumped, open, the clumped, close, the closest, and increasing fire and decreasing uh, the competition parameter. And we also can find the power law distribution of the tree canopy uh, that can be arise from interacting effects of competition and fire. And this uh, power law is very close to, uh, to percolation transition. For a certain value of biomass, uh, we have the percolation and then we found a power law distribution. <coughs> so, uh, just to finish in, uh, the last work that was related to evolution and uh, how the mate system and the life story of a species affects the resistance uh, of male and female. So, uh, we have sex bias in parasitism that is very steady and uh, in, in a diverse range of taxes and mostly we found more uh, male as the secret sex. Of course we found for some species that the female are the secret one, but commonly we found more secret uh, male than females. And this process uh, what sex bias parasitism <coughs> is unclear. So in order to understand how uh, we can find the male bias parasitism, we study life story process and change the mating system to understand how the resistance to infections evolve. So we have here males uh, <coughs> with uh, several characteristics that favor to become more secret species than females. The behavior that leads to great exposure, like more risk to infection due to damage caused by fighting. Uh, the larger size in some species, the males are the larger than females. And they, they are more uh, accessible. They <coughs> become a, a good target for pa parasites. And uh, the effects of androgenic hormones in males that depress the immune system is also uh, the characteristics that favor the infection in males. So the end of this study is study how mating system and differences in competitive ability and longevity between sex influence the level of res uh, resistance to infections that evolves. To do that, we use a classical host parasite model. We adapted this host parasite into sex host parasite. And we have considered here uh, susceptible and infected. And since we described separately, we have susceptible fem females and susceptible males, infected females and infected males. And we studied the life process, considered the competition for results among females and males, and we, we considered the death, how uh, lifespan changes and the transmission rate. So here, the parameter that will evolve will be the transmission rate. When we increase the transmission rate, we decrease the resistance of the of male or females. And here we consider a birth function that in this birth function we can select the offspring rate to make differences between males and females and then select the uh, mate system. <coughs> this is called the hair size. So if you consider uh, age lower than one, we have a polyandry system in which it, the polyandry and polygyny are 
polygamic cases. In the first one, the polyandry, we have the female has more than one male mate. In the second polygamy system, we have the polygyny, in which a male <coughs> has more than one female mate. And then we consider as well the monogamy, in which males and females have one, one mate. And to do that, we choose a trade-off between the offspring rate and the transmission rate. So we do that in order to guarantee that the in this study, we are not interested in speciation. So we just want to see how the level of resistance evolves. So we choose the, the parameters in order that the, the resident become is a stable solution. And then we allow a mutant to appear in the system at a very low level, and this cannot change the, the environment in which is the, the residence. And then we see if this mutant population can invade or not. If this mutant population can invade, it becomes the new resident one. If not, we have the resident one. And all the time we calculate the population that is an attractor. So how do we do that? We consider the previous system for the resident and for the mutant. Since we know previously that the resident is at the stable point, uh, is the, the attractor, we have to study only the mutant case. So in how do you do that? We calculate the fitness that basically is the eigenvalues of the mutant uh, subsystem. So the eigenvalues of the subsystem referring to the resident are always uh, a growing eigenvalues since it's, uh, they are at the they, they represent in the, the attractor solution. So we have to analyze if this mutant has a growing eigenvalue or not. So if so, we have an attractor and then this mute, uh, the resident can be replaced by the mutant one. So in, in, in order to calculate the evolutionary singular point, we calculate the gradient of the fitness that is the leading eigenvalue of the submatrix C that represents the mutant case. So, we calculating the fitness, we have the fitness is a function of parameters related to transmission, in this case, the transmission rate of the mutants and the transmission rate of, in this case, that we always calculate at the, um, I didn't show here, but at the fixed point in which the resident is a stable solution and consider uh, the mutants around zero. And then we calculate all the time the singular point that is an attractor. So all the graphs, what I did was to calculate the singular point and see how the singular point evolves when changing the transmission rate and changing the other parameters related to the life story. So, in order to understand how the life story and how biomass changes when changed only, in this case, without evolution, we see that in the first two graphs, when increase the higher size and the birth contribution, the birth rate, we see that both uh, males and females evolve, uh, uh, increase by, evolve, here is not in case of evolution. Both populations uh, increase biomass at the same rate. So you see here that both male and female have uh, uh, enlarged population um, at the same time. When we increase the death rate and the competition between um, males and females, we see here that we have more uh, females uh, biomass than males one. Here we increase the death rate uh, of males in comparison of females one. So when we, the death rate is higher for males, we have the biomass of females <coughs> higher than females. So the first study was to evolve, evolve only the male characteristics. So we fix all the parameters related to females and evolve the parameters related to the males. We see here that when we change the, the mating system, we can, found, uh, we can find a male biasic parasitism 
for lower values of age, and this means a case of polyandry mating system. So when age, if you remember age is lower than one, we found the polyandry. And we see that for this virus, the transmission rate is very high, and this means that the resistance is low in comparison to the female one that is fixed in this case. The other case happens that increasing the death rate when uh, males are shorter lifespan in comparison of females, we see that we find uh, male bioparasitism in this case. And the same for the competition. So, increasing the competition among males uh, in comparison to females, we have uh, uh, less resistance to males in comparison to the females. Oh, sorry. Uh, now, uh, we study the co-evolutionary point. We want to see not only favoring one male, just evolving one, one but evolving both males and females, and to see how resistance changes when we evolve both uh, characteristics. What we did, we changed, uh, we changed the, the parameters, in this case the competition and mortality, and evolved uh, the transmission rate for females, and then separately evolved the, males, uh, the transmission rate for males. And then the crossing curves will be considered the co-evolutionary points. So how this point evolves means each point of this one is one point of this kind. We see here for, consider the coevolutionary point, the mate, uh, mate system does not produce bias in, uh, in this case. But with increase the competition, we see here that male bias the parasitism appears for higher competition among uh, males and when the males have shorter lifespan in comparison to females one. But we see here that the uh, mating system can increase the male bias the parasitism. We see here for polyandry case we have a less resistance to males than, rather than males when we increase the competition for resources. And the same we can observe here in the case uh, of uh, for short lifespan for males. As I conclude, we studied a male bias the parasitism that was selected for when males have a short lifespan than females. So basically, when males have short lifespan, they can invest, we invest less on resistance. And uh, we found find male bias parasitism when they were subject to greater competition for resources in comparison to female. And we see that changes to the mating system do not produce bias, but can accentuate existing bias, as uh, we can see here. So evolving the competition and mortalities, we see here that uh, the bias and parasitism in the case of males uh, is accentuated when changing the mating system. So we see that polyandry cases and the monogamy cases are uh, accentuated more than polygenic cases. So, uh, therefore, predict that male bias parasitism when males have short lifespan than females in monogamous and polyandry species. So, and now I've shown that all works I've presented. I could work with ecological elements like competition, predation, host parasite, and climate change, and natural selections, and I use different uh, methodologies to study these different processes in ecological systems, like differential equations, individual-based models, adaptive dynamics, and we have some results that could answer some questions related to patterns in savanna, how uh, we can stabilize uh, coexistence between trees and increase it. So we've studied so sections of species in the process of it, eutrophications and contaminants. So what, which is the role of endotrogenic uh, uh, perturbations in the system? We, we have studied competition between primary producers and the effects of the global warming and the patterns in savannas and the evolutions of resistance to infections. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation and let's proceed to discuss uh, the contents of, the, of your work. So please, Professor Sintes.
So, okay, first of all, um, uh, congratulations for your work and also to your advisor. But I think you did a, a very great and interesting job. And also to your presentation that it has been very nice and clear and very organized. Um, yeah, since I'm the local one, maybe I have, <laughs> yeah, uh, I have just a very few comments about your, about your work. So I'll try to be fast. So the first, of, the first one is about the, um, the first study you did on, on contaminants. Yeah. On contaminants. Uh, it's also quite interesting that, that even the, the toxicity was just set at, at one of these low lev uh, traffic mm -hmm. levels. Mm -hmm. The most affected one were the top predators. Mm -hmm. And also you stay in your, in your thesis that uh, probably this kind of models due to the lack of bi bioaccumulation of this toxicity to upper traffic levels mm -hmm. could be somehow unrealistic. But uh, do you think that uh, implementing such bioaccumulation to upper traffic levels will change qualitatively the results you get? or will just reinforce the, the fact that the, the top the predators will be even more affected by that? I think, uh, uh, I don't know, I can't still wish to do that, but uh, as I could, I have the opportunity to talk with biologists, in this case it's very common that top predators is, is a result that is, uh, uh, as a point of mathematical point of view, it's interesting and this comes from the non-linearities of the equations, but in nature this happens. When the, the, we change the, the bottom of food chain, the top predators are more affected. This is not new for the biologists. But it's an interesting result that you can uh, have this result through uh, non-linear equations and have this result. So I, I think that if you uh, consider the, the accumulation, in this case we accentuate this uh, in, 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 the, in the next chapter about these shallow coastal ecosystems, um, you haven't commented in the presentation about the sensitivity of your results to the initial conditions. That seems, you comment, that seems to play a major role, mm -hmm. more in, in some cases, even more than changing one of the primary producers, most like nutrients or light. In the, mm -hmm. uh, would you like to make some comments on that? No, basically we consider that the same initial conditions and uh, uh, what we see is that changing the flows of nutrients input are more important in this case. And the populations, uh, the stability of the population spreads to the same but depends on uh, how we change the parameters in the nutrients input rather than the initial conditions regarding two species of uh, the primary producers in this case. So the nutrients input are more important than the, so that the initial conditions related to the inputs of nutrients are more important than the, the, the other, another case. Uh, this is not somehow contradictory to the, what is stating, say, which is some words didn't find the correlations between this kind of yeah. the nutrients uh, inputs with the, uh, yeah. Um, oh, yes, one final comment. In, in, the, in the Savannah model, you look for the, for the probability of survival against fire when the number of neighbors of uh, adult trees surrounding for a juvenile tree. And this, in, this increases dramatically when you change up to eight, and this is completely surrounded by adult trees. This means that, that fire is more important than in the tree tree competition in the model. No, it's not more important, but I, I show you. The last one. Yeah, this one. This one, isn't it? Yeah, the, the competition file. What we see here is that the competition parameter is very important. 
But you see that the protection, if you consider, there is a certain threshold of the competition parameter. So it depends on uh, if the, the competition parameter is too high, we see that the competition wins against the protection. But if you have uh, low values of competition parameter, despite you have uh, all the neighbors surrounded, we have that the positive effect uh, wins the, the negative one. So it depends the intensity of the, the parameter on competition. So it can have both, but it depends on the, the competition. I don't know if I was yeah. clear. Um. Hopefully in the next slide or in the previous one, or in the previous one. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, we didn't consider here the uh, negative effect. Okay. Only the protection. Okay. So then I took out okay, all okay. the, the okay, rules and okay. then okay. I studied the all effects positive and negative separately, okay. and then I combined this two one and to see. Uh, okay. So I mean, I, I, I didn't get it. <laughs> um, I think that's. Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Kaliba. Thank you. First of all, congratulations for the for the work. And uh, it's, it's, it was a um, we were working together in the treasure project. Then it was a it's a, it was a pleasure to work with uh, with you and with Emilio. Mm -hmm. And um, I have some some. Questions, or uh, I think I would like to if you could elaborate in several parts. And for example, in uh, in the first, in the first, when you consider those response called this sigmoidal shape, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if you are, if you are aware, but in in some cases, is um, there is the so-called uh, Olmesis effect in which, this? yeah, in which uh, at the beginning all the contaminant has a some sort of positive effect. There is a going down the curve, and then there is you. You have always the sigmoidal this And could you elaborate on how this will change your? Uh, at the, only at the beginning you have this positive effects of contaminants on, on survival on mortality. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate how this will change your uh, your uh, your bifurcation diagram? So yes, sure. Okay. Here we, you can see that the side model function I have told but was a little bit uh, faster. But in this case we can see better than the second one. Here we see that the for uh, we can see clearly the side model uh, effects of the, the contaminants. We see that very low values of contaminants will have the same sequence as in the case of the absence of contaminants. Mm -hmm. And as increasing we see the, that the, the bifurcation increases the side model function of the contaminants and all the, the, the bifurcations stabilize in the saturation point of the side model function. So they are displaced at the same way as the shape of the side model function uh, to higher values of the nutrient input. And related to, to this and your work on, on uh for evolutionary dynamics, you 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 put in the in the in the thesis there is a in the first chapter of the of the, of the thesis there is a, how you you apply to well you show an example to apply the evolutionary dynamics to a new, uh, I think a phytoplankton or plankton model. Do you think you could do the same with the canal chemostat uh, model? And how this could <laughs> change the dynamics? <laughs> I don't, you know. I don't know, but I, I think uh, we can apply it since uh, you have uh, several parameters related to life story, like mortality, competition, uh, the same parameters as I used in host parasite. It's very similar model. I just have to study it and to see how uh, it in and just make a question before which parameter we, we will evolve in this case. Uh, in which it change, will change the mortalities or how the mortality can be resistant to contaminants will be different. In order to study the transmission rate, we can <coughs> study the, the mortality. How life story uh, change the mortalities, change when we increase the contaminants in this case. How the, 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 the life, uh, the short life span will change if you will increase or decrease when the contaminants 
are added in the, in the ecosystem. I think it's possible to do that. Okay. And um, concerning the savanna, do you expect the changes in you increase the lattice, the size of the lattice of the or of the the form, the shape of the lattice instead to triangular or savanna? Do you expect that you are going to have a uh, change in uh, the resource, or do you expect that the, the model will behave in the same? Uh, actually, I did. <laughs> uh, in considering the hexagonal uh, lattice, uh, but I found the same results, and I've tried with another, not too large, uh, but uh, I've tried to uh, until 400, because this one is 200 to 200 lattice, I, I've studied another until 400 lattice size, and I found that the same results. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I, I is it for larger one, but I don't think we change it too much. But to change the, the geometric mm -hmm. of the lattice, consider the hexagonal lattice, I found the, the same results. So we can see um, a more curved shapes of the five fronts. Mm -hmm. So I saw that it, I was forcing the, the shapes and then, as uh, it was the same, I prefer to use a regular one rather than the hexagonal because that, uh, regular is easier and faster to, to work and to plot is easier as well. And the results were, were the same. Then I have another comment on the, concerning the question of the, the first question on the sensitivity to the, to the initial conditions. I think this is. One thing is the, 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 the resource that uh, Flora presented, the other is we try, we were trying to, in the same, in, the, in this world, we were trying also to interpret the supposed experiments that were carried out. And, the, and this was the problem of the initial condition of these mesoconscious experiments, in which we calculated that in order to reach a steady state concentration, the, the system will need more time than the mesocosmic experiments. And then the, the transient, all the mesocosmic experiments were in transient phase, and then for this reason, we, we, we postulate that this was one of the reasons because for which the, um, the Mesopotamia Spain couldn't prove clearly that there was, um, there was an effect on nutrients in the, in the system. So they say they, they carry, they, we, we show with the model that you need several, several years to reach a state, state concentration, and the Mesopotamia Spain were carried out in a few months, then it was not possible to. This was one explanation where we try to validate the model. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Professor Escudero. Well, um, I would like to congratulate you too for the thesis. I found uh, pretty good uh, scientific, uh, but it is uh, very nice to look into. I would like to make a uh, more particular one thing. Congratulations to your supervisor. I have uh, some questions. One, for instance, is uh, in terms of modeling. In the Savannah model, uh, the young trees, juvenile trees, they don't burn. But adult trees, uh, they no, burn. No. Yeah, it's the way around. The uh, adult trees, they don't. But uh, I would like to know the reason why. why is this uh, modeling assumes some reasonable? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, uh, I've told, but very quickly, that the adult uh, trees species are more resistant. They evolved a different way as the uh, uh, trees in forests. So they have uh, parts and, and uh, of the tree that uh, are more thick than in the case of trees and forests. So they are more resistant to high levels of temperature and they are more resistant to be burned. And since the fire in savannas are very low uh, level, they don't, uh, the fire doesn't reach the canopy of trees. So this is a, a cause of uh, top-down uh, dying of trees in forest. In this case in savannah, the fire is very low, so it doesn't reach the canopy, and the high levels that reach the, the, the other part of trees, does, it's not uh, uh, enough to kill these trees, because these trees evolved uh, they have a evolutionary process in which they evolve a resistance to fire. This is published in, in biological papers and it's very well documented. Yes, and uh, I have one question about the same model, but about uh, its dynamics. 
I see that there is no uh, introduction of new trees into the system. Yeah. Yes, it oh. No, no, new trees, mm -hmm. no. Uh, we have a birth rate. So yes. each adult tree can see it spread seeds around it. Yeah, that's right, but uh, no introduction, uh, introduction from uh, backing. No. So uh, the state with uh, no trees at all is uh, absorbing in its, in its sense. So at least I guess there is some question of time scales. I mean, uh, if there is some uh, large fluctuation that kills all the trees, mm -hmm. then uh, the the grass state will be definitive forever. So uh, I think that the, the savanna is some kind of metastable state. There should be some kind of time scale competition somehow. Yeah, this happens the same as in the case of the forest fire models. Mm -hmm. But there are some uh, uh, not. Uh, Savannas is not all, only a, a transition state, but it's a fixed state. It depends on the, the parameters related to fire and the recovery rate. That is, after fire, uh, we have an ashes state. And how the ashes recover to grasses. So in forest fire model, these are the, the main parameters. And this will determine if the trees will survive or, or remain as a stable uh, state or not. This, say, this case uh, passed the same way as Savannah's case. So uh, it depends on, on the time. Of course, I made simulations for many years, and what we found is oscillation around the Savannah's state. So I didn't show here the graphs of biomass and time, but uh, I don't know if I have some here. I can show you uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, we see that, uh, of course, change the parameters of fire, we see that uh, the grass state is a solid state and goes through transition. But for the parameters that we study, in which stabilize the coexistence between these two species, uh, we have both. Uh, let me see. One graph that uh, was uh, the study of uh, the how biomass of trees changes over time. But unfortunately, I don't have easily. No. It's okay. I have uh, one one technical question about the dynamical systems. Um, how how do you think you solve them? Uh, using commercial software or using some well-known algorithm? I, I it was not totally clear for me. I use uh, depends on the work. And the first one, I use XPP out for make uh, run the simulations of bifurcations. I use this one. And of course, I made analysis because I cal I've calculated all the transcritical, I have analytical uh, equations for these bifurcations. So I calculate analytically. And to proceed with the bifurcation, I've used uh, XPP. And uh, for the other uh, works, I've made my own count. Codes and Fortran. Uh, and and what, what kind of algorithm would you use for this? Um, my for the code? Yeah. yeah, I use my algorithm. Ah, to choose. Runga or. or hmm? Only Runga Kita. Runga Kuta. <laughs> for, for further, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Classical one. Yeah, the classical one. And well, I have a Mujakuta. final question. Uh, it's about uh, population dynamics. Well, in your thesis, you say that, for instance, in the Malthus model, which is probably the simplest, uh, you can assume this uh, Malthusian growth, but uh, when the population becomes too large, there should be some competition or something which stabilizes growth. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would like to mention that uh, if the population becomes too small, then the, the continuum assumption uh, breaks down. So you can model it in terms of, well, a master equation or uh, mark on uh, continuous time, uh, time Markov chain, as it is sometimes called, and this can have a very interesting uh, interaction with some effects, for instance, this uh, enrichment paradox. For instance, if you solve uh, the log cover model, mm -hmm. instead of using uh, continuum equations, but using 
probabilistic formulation, analytically or numerically, what you find is that uh, starting near the center, uh, the population is spinning around uh, with uh, increasing radius. So eventually, it collides with the axis and it becomes extinct. So uh, in your case, you have increasing the uh, well, and at the time to extinction is faster if you have a very large number of prey and a very uh, small number of predators, which is kind of contributive result. Mm -hmm. And this is somehow matches very well with the paradox of, of enrichment. Because yeah. in this case... Yeah, this is this case. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. no, yeah. The paradox of enrichment. In order to stabilize the dog predator population, increase the nutrient input, mm -hmm. This is, uh, you can do this until a certain point mm -hmm. in which the system is, is start oscillating. But, uh, but I guess in the uh, continuous system, the limit cycle will never uh, collide with the axis. Yeah. But if you it have mm -hmm. fluctuations because just of the, mm -hmm. just of considering a discrete number of, of these cycles can be and you you'll find that if the cycle is uh, very, uh, very large, mm -hmm. the part of it which is close to the axis may it may it, uh, jump. When the system is in that, in that place, mm -hmm. it may jump to the axis, causing extinction. So this happened in, the, in this case when we apply the contaminants to the second, uh, I think was the previous one. Okay. Now the li limit cycles touch the hyperplane in which the top predators is zero. So we have a whole bifurcation here. It's a kind of paradox of arrangement. But here, this cycle touch okay. the hyperplane and then the system remains oscillating this hyperplane. Mm -hmm. Is it Yeah, I mean, uh, this is, of course, a deterministic uh, mechanism, but it's somehow analogous to the one I was mm -hmm. mentioning. But here, it's a very nice example. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. And, uh, Okay, so Professor Fernandez Silva. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to Emil for inviting uh, the, the UEP and you know, thank you for being uh, here in, in my work that you for a big part on this. Actually, you know, it was an honor for me to be here. And uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Claudia for her thesis and also the media and the of people who helped me do developing the thesis also for the great job. Uh, uh, I <coughs> tried to follow some your work and try at least to make a comment on each of the four uh, subjects that you addressed. Uh, the choice of themes that you have chosen uh, shows that you have uh, developed a great competence in mm -hmm. nonlinear physics in general, but uh, I'd like to stress in the uh, continuous dynamics, uh, differential equation, as well as on cellular automata uh, models, and uh, to address properly uh, the with, uh, questions from an ecological point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in the first uh, work, I'd like to comment on those, exactly on those uh, subjects that you are <coughs> talking about. On the hope bifurcations and on the uh, coordination to bifurcation. In that, uh, precisely in that slide that you have behind it. No problem. You just uh, uh, point the, uh, the M as mm -hmm. a coordination to bifurcation. But in principle, uh, whenever you have uh, lines where they cross, you have also coordination to the patient, but you do not call the attention to them, only to that one. Why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just but because of the result of biological mm -hmm. result. Mm -hmm. Because in this case, uh, we have a transcritical bifurcation too, and then this line happens before this one. And then we have this whole bifurcation that it's not. Uh, uh, has no effect in this case, but after the coordination, mm -hmm. the uh, coordination point, we see that this line crosses stability, 
And then what we have that this open bifurcation, it's a open bifurcation that has effect and then the system will mm -hmm. real, uh, oscillate in this case. So this is important in this case because since this system uh, starts mm -hmm. oscillating the hyperplane and which top relate is zero, this uh, transcritical bifurcation that happened first, mm -hmm. that was a stable one, uh, will not happen. So the system is start oscillating before the top predators appear as a non-zero population. So that's why I, I explain more that, of course, when we have a coordination to uh, bifurcation point, we have another kinds of uh, bifurcation that arises uh, from this point. But the, the main question in here was not to analyze mathematically. Of course, I, I, I play around with this. <coughs> But I will try to answer the question related to the, the biology. So, uh, correct, I think. Uh, let's go then to uh, work number two. Uh, there you put together three different models, or four different models, if you include the red last one. Uh, and I had uh, serious troubles <laughs> to understand how these models are covered. And at last, uh, I was, uh, was convinced and I convinced myself that it was only doing the shadow effect. It's the U variable, I think, that occurs. No, because they were close. <coughs> because uh, the. The main question here is how these primary producers compete for resources and light. So in case of the light, we have the shading effect. Yes. So this is uh, related to the high brightness uh, rather than the, the coherence of equations. But in the case of the nutrients, uh, in this case, I, I think I have the equations here. Uh, we have uh, the equations are coupled to uh, the growth rates and the uptaking rates. So in the case, we have the growth rate. In the growth rate, we have the cons uh, considerations of the, the nitrification process. So in this way, the equations are coupled. So we have the, the growth uh, rate here. Here is and a model, uh, model for Z. Okay. Yeah, it was published by Bossy. The concentration. So we have uh, one equation that is related to the shoot biomass, another one that is related to the rhizome. So in this case that I've shown in the last result, the rhizome can uptake on ammonia. So this that's why we have a symmetry in the in the last result uh, uh, when uptaking ammonia and nitrate. So we have all the compartments of mm -hmm. Sustera marina and uh, uh, <laughs> And then we have the, the another equations uh, for Ulva Brigida and the same here we have the growth and we cope these equations with the nitrification process. Okay, it's clear uh, that uh, when you couple and you have long tables, you see uh, where everything you put together, it's just mm -hmm. difficult to find where they really uh, are related. I could localize only on table 6 one, the K, I, Z. Mm -hmm. And there is a U that is in, from other, but I yeah. do not uh, realize the F, uh, N, O. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> These are the equations that represent the nitrification process in the mm -hmm. water column and in the sediments. Okay. okay. My suggestion would be only that when you would do this again, and whenever <laughs> you uh, explain everything, they say, note that the two couplings are those. <laughs> I think I need a one hour, <laughs> yeah. one hour more to explain. If you want, you can start to explain all that. No, 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 no. It's just one point because I have to look for, uh, to take a, a great effort to localize where were the, the interference between the variables from the uh, all four mm -hmm. different uh, models. Okay. I could localize only one, the, the second one uh, I missed it really, I could not miss it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, since I could only localize the, the shading, it's, uh, it's amazing that the shading 
It's so important. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. if you forget the, the, the shaping of, uh, of life. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I, I, uh, I really could not believe that uh, only due, uh, due, due to the shading effect, uh, the differential regimes could, uh, could set. So yeah, it's very interesting, but uh, since uh, in this model we are speaking about primary producers, mm -hmm. the primary producers have realized photosynthesis and they need light to mm -hmm. survive. And uh, the photosynthesis, they uptake uh, the nitrate and then they transform in ca carbohydrates and in the process of phytosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So light is very important of mm -hmm. the, the primary producers. Mm -hmm. So if there is no light, they can realize... Yeah, but, but the effect is so huge. Uh, I mean, that uh, the, the light can completely... Uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, in, the, in the case of bloom effects, the, mm -hmm. in Salvador we have the mm -hmm. Maria Vermelha, mm -hmm. and uh, the algae uh, completely cover all the surface. And this is very strong effect to the species that in the, mm -hmm. the sea mm here. -hmm. And then the light is to reduce the, up to a, a point that mm -hmm. they cannot uh, realize photosynthesis and they start dying. But basically, the, this species start dying because uh, one is start mm -hmm. dying and then uh, happens the, the process of uh, uh, decomposition mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, more complex than, than that. The lighting is a stopping point, so some of them stop dying, and then the process of decomposition mm -hmm. uh, make a crisis of oxygen, and they die because of amoxic phase. So let's go to number three. Mm -hmm. Number three is the uh, uh, savanna forest model. Uh, it is, I found it very interesting because uh, uh, if, you look, if we think that model, that model, and you compare with the usual forest fire model, you can think of the as the adult trees as being some fine sites where uh, a fire cannot propagate. Okay, and uh, this mines uh, mean, uh, on a diff uh, quite different uh, process. Uh, I tries to do some work to control the size of avalanches in self organized critical systems. Mm -hmm. And the first one was to just to, to uh, set a, uh, an effect, uh, an interference as to explode, to cause some uh, uh, outside avalanche, outside of the usual dynamics of the process. Mm -hmm. And then this reduces really the, the size of avalanches that you but uh, since the forest fire model is a self organized critical model, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it seems that uh, a, second, a second way that we thought that we could remove, uh, reduce the size of avalanche was to find some site, sites. If you find some sites, then they are resistant and they will not propagate avalanches. Mm -hmm. And you have exactly this kind of, uh, of effect. But uh, in your uh, results, you do not uh, mention the statistics of the avalanches. Mm -hmm. So it would really be interesting to see if uh, uh, how is the statistic of this model, the avalanche statistics, the size of the avalanche statistics, mm -hmm. and uh, if it is uh, comparable, or if it reduces the size of great avalanches mm -hmm. in comparable with the usual uh, model. Okay. This is something that you have not done. You have paid attention to the yeah. pattern of the savanna, yeah. and uh, but I think yeah, that would be a, a, a good suggestion to follow to see if the, this effect of mm -hmm. would be to reduce the, the size of the of the avalanches. Okay. okay so, uh, and <laughs> and uh, a second uh, comment on this uh, work uh, too is uh, the issue of the uh, you just mentioned briefly on the phase transition between the savanna and the grass. Uh, could you also comment, uh, show the, that slide and make some more comments on that? Yes. What you consider uh, the grassland is when the trees, adult trees, uh, 
uh, are no longer present. So the a tree is a complete When the tree goes to here in this mm -hmm. graph, when the mm -hmm. coordinate we have with the adult tree density. Mm -hmm. And here is the lighting parameter. Mm -hmm. So when increasing the frequency of fire in mm -hmm. savannas, we have a transition to the coexistence mm -hmm. to the grassland. So if the fire appears, mm -hmm. because normally fire is a natural process in savanna, mm -hmm. normally appears once per year or one time each three years. So if the frequency goes more than this, mm -hmm. we have too much fire and then um, the seeds will, uh, will be burned mm -hmm. and then we reduce the biomass of trees and then we have this extinction mm -hmm. of trees and then we have this transition. Okay, so there is really due, due to the presence of the, uh, I mean, if the, exactly as you explained, uh, trees die by natural causes. Yeah. Okay, so the, if there is not a replenishment of, of trees, then uh, they, at the end they will die at, uh, completely, yes. and uh, the, the the increase in the frequency of uh, fire uh, reduces the possibility of two two fold, two -fold effect uh, that the seeds uh, that the that the seeds will grow into uh, juvenile right. trees, and that juvenile trees and receive the pro uh, the protection of the adult trees. Yes. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. we will reduce the positive and negative effects since mm -hmm. we have have less mm -hmm. tree adult tree biomass, so we have mm -hmm. less protection and we have less spreading of seeds uh, mm -hmm. in the savannas. Okay. Okay. So it's an indirect effect because mm -hmm. the fire doesn't kill trees, doesn't okay. burn trees, but kills the seeds and the juvenile tree with most roots. Mm -hmm. is not, uh, they are not resistant to fire. Okay, the, the phase transition, uh, it seems that uh, you happen only if, I mean, with a well-defined critical point and so on, mm -hmm. only if you increase the, the recovery. The, the recovery. Rate. Rate. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's more accentuated. This mm -hmm. is an important parameter in the case of the forest fire model. Mm -hmm. So basically they play with this one, and then the second one. Mm -hmm. But it seems that here in the savannas the frequency of fire is more important than the recovery rate. Mm -hmm. And forest fire models, this one is uh, mm -hmm. the, the parameter that will determine the distinctions of trees and then the mm -hmm. forest. Because this will determine the fuel. Mm -hmm. So if we recover it quickly, mm -hmm. so we have more fuel and the mm -hmm. fire can spread and burn out all the lattice. This is what will happen uh, in the case of uh, forests. But in the case of savannas, the frequency of fire is not uh, the same. And then uh, what happens this effect is reduced. Mm -hmm. and, and then because here we have uh, time scales that is very different mm -hmm. in the dynamics. So the fire in savannas is very quick. So in case of forests, we can have uh, weeks. And days. In this case of savanna, the seconds and we have uh, fire spread around, and that's it. And then uh, what's uh, a trick to simulate this? Because I have one time scale that is regarding to growth rates and death probabilities that takes years, and then we have uh, uh, seconds, hours that is the time scale related to fire. This is also a point that uh, this transition, this side of this transition, is also a point that uh, I would consider, in fact, suggest you to consider again for further studies. Okay. So to, to just analyze the, 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 the transition, the, the, the phase transition. And finally, to number four, I have only one uh, question. You consider the SI model, say, uh, susceptible infected. It's more usual to consider either SIR, uh, susceptible infected recover, or SIS, susceptible infected, susceptible. Uh, mm -hmm. Why should we just consider this SI and so on? I mean, from the studies on uh, propagation of diseases, usually one considers SIS or SIF. I R or 
even some more complicated. But SI, it was really, you see that uh, you can put uh, the asymmetry between males and females only with SI. Yeah, we could use that. We, take, we mm -hmm. took the simplest mm -hmm. one, the classical one, and this just adapted since we will enlarge the equations mm -hmm. because we consider not only the groups of species but consider the sex mm -hmm. of these species. Mm -hmm. So we enlarge equations and then when we work with the Newton equations, so we have a double of equations when we work with that. So in order to simplify and just mm -hmm. uh, to study the effects of life stories and the mating system, it was mm -hmm. not necessary in this the mm -hmm. starting study to consider more complicated equations. This is really mm -hmm. complicated more when you consider the Newton's cases. Uh, one interpretation uh, of the result you had uh, on that uh, issue, when you consider that both uh, male and female characteristics could be changed uh, in the last slides, you considered... Uh, yes, that. Uh, you consider that the co-evolutionary point. Uh, that means, if I have really understood, that uh, although the invading uh, population is only uh, females, this will cause uh, that the females' original population will develop a new character. Is this uh, what happens? Yes, this is what happens. When, when one population is invaded to the resident, they become the resident one. So mm -hmm. if the the mutants, the fitness of mutants is a growing fitness. Mm -hmm. This will grow and then this population will replace the another mm -hmm. one population. Okay, I understand that, uh, and but then, you, you define the beta M tilt as the, uh, as the, as the uh, infection rate for the, uh, for the male population. Mm -hmm. But how does can affect the beta F? The beta F. Firstly, we evolved the beta F in mm -hmm. comparison with increasing the male parameter. Mm -hmm. So we evolved this one. So here we have the female and then we evolve the males. Just to take a rate of male related mm -hmm. to female with its one and then we see how in this case it is one mm -hmm. uh, a male and female competition parameter has the same value. So in order to evolve both, we fix one, evolve one, and just evolve the transmission rate, and then compare with the competition. So we evolve uh, the transmission rate of female in comparison with increasing competition for resources. We can do the other way around, because we take the, the rate of this one, and then we evolve the male transmission rate. And when you cross the true evolution of male and female, we have the evolutionary point mm -hmm. that we consider as a co-evolutionary point. So for each point on this graph, we evolve one in the other, it's a uh, answer, and then we take uh, this one and then we will change the competition. For, um, it was how we evolve both together. So there are odd techniques that we can do uh, co-evolution. We can evolve both at the same time. Mm -hmm. But this is established one, we can do that separately and then cross course of evolutions and the evolutionary point will be the crossing uh, of the course. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so now it's my turn. So I want to start as my colleague by congratulating you for the nice job you've done here in this thesis, also congratulating your supervisor. Uh, but this can always be interpreted as a, an exercise of politeness, but in your case, I think you're well aware of the merits of your work, because you, in the last transparency you put, you made a good summary of what are the merits of your, your thesis. I mean, you study uh, a wide variety of systems, very different from each other. You have used many different techniques, and you have found interesting results in all the cases. So I think the, the work is great. And as I told you before, I like very much also the, the booklet. <laughs> and your presentation was great. So in that respect, I'm very happy to be here. And OK, uh, 
being the last one, of course, most of my questions have been already addressed. <laughs> but still, I mean, uh, I, I still have some uh, comments on some of them, uh, which I would like you uh, to know your opinion about them. For instance, the question that uh, was uh, already asked by uh, Professor Sintes about the sensitivity to the parameters of your uh, second model, I think, the, one the of the, the yeah. algae. Um, right, right. Uh, I mean, given that uh, these models are so sensitive to the initial conditions, and of course, if you change the parameters, also the result can change drastically. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be more logical to make a, a stochastic modeling of these kind of systems? I mean, introducing noise just, just from the beginning in the modeling and make only probabilistic predictions. I mean, I'm surprised because if this is. This is the house of noise, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that your group has been studying stochastic systems all, all, all right. the time, and I'm surprised not to see them here. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, tell right. me your opinion about that. <laughs> yeah, the, this uh, study was very interesting, because we started studying many models to describe the mesocosmos uh, results, and we didn't... Um, in this case, we use it in the second work I'm talking about. Yeah. So we we uh, choose use um, previous existing and validated models in order to adjust the, the data we have and then to try to explain the, the, the results uh, of competition between the primary producers. But we didn't think about to introduce in this uh, system to change uh, more, but just couple this subsistence uh, yeah. in order to to see how the interaction between these two uh, affects, affects the the switch of stabilities of the primary producers, right. but uh, we didn't yeah, account they are. Yeah, but according, according to where you find, I think it is, uh, sounds pretty logical because it's the kind it's the kind of problem you find, for instance, when you use meteorological models yeah, that right. you find very sensi uh, sensitiveness to the <laughs> parameters. <laughs> And then you can only make uh, stochastic predictions or only probabilities. You can say the probability of that tomorrow rains is whatever and no more than that because mm -hmm. if you change a little bit, you can, if you try to do a deterministic prediction, you can change the result a lot. Yeah, you're right. Rather right. than we use uh, um, uh, the forcing functions, we use parameters to, from meteorological stations in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. In order mm -hmm. to use stochastic, we use real data. To right. simulate the forcing of solar radiation and temperature right. over the year, right. rather than a stochastic, we adjust for real parameter. No right. to have this. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know that. I mean, I realize that your model is already very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> that noise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another. Oh, yeah. I have a comment on this because I presented this was the first part of the of the modeling approach. The second part we wanted to cover with a. Um, we wanted to study a real case, uh -huh. and then we, in the in the threshold, we were studying a, a, a Tau Lagoon in a French Lagoon in France, in which they have Saucer and Urba coexisting, and then there is another lagoon in uh, in Italy when Urba has dominated as uh, Saucer is extinct, and then we we wanted to, and I think we, we have some uh, we have some results of, of the of the carbon. In this case, the, the model is forced by meteorological. Conditions, and then you have all the yeah. stochasticity to the, the, the to the to the system. Right. But uh, we are still are, we are still working on it. But is it the case that you can find different systems with more or less similar conditions and with different situations? Right. Okay. So it's clear then. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I also have a concern. Well, I, I, I had the same question as Professor Scudero about the the uh, Savannah Phi model. Concerning the, the fact that uh, the grassland is a, it's an absorbing state, mm -hmm. but then as you were discussing, I, will, I realized that no matter how fast the, the fire occurs, the adult trees always survive. Mm -hmm. So the, the only way that it disappears completely is that they just die, and they die at an exponential rate. So mm -hmm. you need exponential times in order to, well, I mean, you need a, a, at least a, a time longer than the, the death rate yeah. in order to, to get the total extinction. So. In that, I mean, my question was was concerned about the uh, you have a transition which is or looks continuous, but of course, I mean, you're taking the average of the, the adult trees, yeah. and this average can be either the average along the run 
or it can be the average of, uh, yeah, uh, of different uh, analyzations. Simulations. Simulations. Like, uh, yeah. So that's, that's my point. In some simulations, you can find that it, it, it gets extinct, and in some others, that it don't. And my question was whether you're averaging both or you're. Or it's just the average among a single realization that you find and it's exactly the same value. You know what I mean? No, yes, it was not the same value. This yeah. is an average around several simulations. In right. this case, around, uh, I don't know if in this one it was 500 simulations, but all the simulations I, I had, I didn't find the, kind, the case in which they. There is extinction. Extinction. Not even very close to the, to the transition no, point. No, they right. were around fluctuating around this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Not, we don't have uh, discontinuity, we don't have uh, large. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, and this is because the, the resistance of the adult trees, I guess. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. thanks. And uh, I didn't show here a graph, but I, I did a study uh, regarding to change the uh, depth parameters. Uh -huh. I put in a, and this facilitates the extinction of trees. Yeah. Of course, I've chosen one parameter in which we, I have the consistent since I went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to study savannas. <laughs> I I chose parameters in which I have savannas. Yeah. Have results about savannas. <laughs> yeah, sounds sensible. <laughs> okay, and uh, about the the last uh, model, I, I must say that the last model I've enjoyed it very much because I, I was very surprised at the result. I mean, uh, I knew about this uh, this effect of the males typically being less resistant to infection in mo many species. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the, uh, the, the explanation I've always heard about uh, uh, from biologists is that uh, testosterone uh, makes you less resistant to to, uh, to infections. But from your model, you can have a, the opposite explanation. I mean, it's the fact that males are perhaps more competitive for resources, or they fight more and has, have, for instance, a higher death rate, that they are less resistant, so they can tolerate uh, the uh, testosterone. If it is uh, some, if it damages somehow the immune system or whatever. So my question is, do you do you know how they measure the effect of testosterone on the on the uh, resistance? Because my point is, maybe it may happen that they just uh, see correlations, and they have interpreted correlations through a causality from testosterone to to uh, to the less resistance to infection. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was was caused by uh, some kind of chemical reaction or whatever, but it might happen is the other way around, mm -hmm. and this same correlation can be explained in the other case. Mm -hmm. So you 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 haven't you don't know about this how they measure that how they how they got the conclusion that the testosterone <coughs> influences the no I don't know how they measure it I'm not biologist I could yeah, yeah, talk yeah. with biologists I could address we have a non biologist here. But I, I really don't know how they measure. They, they, I mean, yeah. it would be it's nice. Really interesting to talk. Yeah, it would be nice to, to know that because, so. as I say, it might, might happen. It might just happen that they measure correlation. Mm -hmm. You see, more testosterone and and more uh, and less resistance to infection, mm -hmm. and they conclude that somehow testosterone is influencing the immune system, and it might just be the other way around, yeah. or something like that. Because I mean, your model looks rather convincing. Mm -hmm. The fact that there is a population effect. That is influencing the parameters. So I like very much this 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 model. Okay, I don't have any further question. If there's any doctor in the audience who wants to to make a question, now is the proper time. Okay. So if not, then we would like to uh, discuss here. The, Yeah, I was always, I always heard this explanation from the other that testosterone is influencing the immune system and this makes you less resistant. So it might just be. Uh, I know. This is That's your relation. The parents always make sure they're related and they tend to be different than that. Sometimes they are. Yeah.